how it goes it, everyone. My name's Luke. I'm one of the instructors here, and I'm actually going to be kind of leading your demo today. Uh, I'm actually assisted by Kuhn. And just so you all know, we're live streaming, which doesn't really affect what's going to happen to you. But if suddenly I'm talking to the voice of Oz, it might be that we have a question from the live stream or something that one of my coworkers will let me know about. So that's what's going to go on. Uh, while we get into this, before we really start, welcome to the Chrysler Museum of Arts Glass Studio. Woo! Ah, ah, yeah, yeah, a little enthusiasm. Cool, cool. Uh, the way we begin, if you guys have not been to one of our demos before, is we have a brief slideshow. I try to keep it a little peppy, a little informative, but this is really to get all of you guys on the same page with this medium. So I have a screen here, 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 and in the event that we lose cabin pressure, oxygen masks will descend from the ceiling and you have to put, okay. <laughs> so first up, what you see on the screen is the Chrysler Museum of Art's glass studio, or the Chrysler Museum of Art proper actually across the street. You've all been there, right? Some of us, we're getting there. The reason that we exist is we are one of the, or we are one of the largest museums with a collection that is in the top three of the country. And our museum is open and free to the public every day, except Monday, we have to have a break. But you can come every day except Monday and check out that collection. So being that we have one of the top three largest, there's Corning, who's the glass museum, and then there's us and Toledo, who are neck and neck. We go back and forth depending on who got what collection, what's going on. But I'm going to say we're number two today. How about that? Cool. We're number two. So what you see on the screen now is the building that you are in right now. This is the Glass Studio. We were actually developed approximately 10 years ago at this point. We're coming around on our birthday or just had it soon. And we are here to help inform you all, the public, about that glass collection that we have in our main museum. The way we do that is through the demos, like you're attending right now, or we also do a lot of outreach into the community via ODU, Virginia Wesleyan, the Governor's School of the Arts, so high schoolers usually come to our facility to use all of our equipment to learn about this material. We also usually do visiting artists. We have one named Corey Pemberton who's coming in a few weeks, and he is actually gonna be leading a special workshop of bringing in more youths in the area to be excited about this medium. One of the other really neat programs that we offer here is the studio assistantship. This is what Kuhn is in right now. We have another gentleman named Griffin who's a part of this. What it is, is it's kind of like an internship residency combo where we usually bring young professionals, not always, but people with a significant background in glass. Maybe they just graduated. Maybe they've done a few intensive courses at a couple craft schools around the country or you've traveled all the way across the world to be here kind of thing. <laughs> so what it is, is you all volunteer your time to help with these educational programs. They help maintain the studio. They help teach the demos, teach the classes. And you guys get your own show. You get your own little class from us that shows you like developing a website, developing business cards, great practices to reach out to art galleries, kind of the little tidbits that school may not have covered just yet. And we're trying to give you that first big step into the art world. So as I said, Kuhn is actually a volunteer here. And for that, I am very appreciative. Give me a little hand. Yeah, thank you. So that's all about us. Let's talk about glass, right? So what I'll do is I'll introduce a studio. I'll introduce a few mediums that are a part of that studio. Kuhn will walk around some samples and we'll kind of get all on the same page. First up, we have our flat shop. This is actually upstairs. It's an education space as well. This is where we'll do stained glass is one of our main mediums. So what you see here is a panel from one of our afternoon workshops of a window hanging. What you'll notice is there's a series of different pieces. What we'll start with is large sheets of glass. We'll show you how to score snap and grind away the edges to make almost like a jigsaw that fits side by side with all your pieces. We'll then teach you how to solder these pieces together. So that's really what all these little metal bits are. 
on it is a little bit of solder holding all those together. In our collections, we have a pretty extensive Tiffany collection, similar to the jeweler, but it's a parallel business that they had of doing lighting and home furnishings a lot. I'm really interested on the lamp that we show because my preconception before becoming an artist was stained glass, you know, like you see in religious buildings or old houses, they're flat. No, not always. It could be dimensional objects, which I really appreciate this lamp for that reason. In the same space as the flat shop that we use for stained glass, we can do fusing. This is akin in that we're again using sheets of glass. We'll score, snap them apart, but things get a little different here. Instead of necessarily going edge to edge with our pieces, we'll start to layer glass and that way we can create patterns that then get placed into a kiln and fired or melted to become one single piece. So the samples that Kuhn was just walking around was one that is about nine different pieces of material. So there's a clear sheet here and then a bunch of little squares. This is just glued with Elmer's glue right now. After it goes through the firing process of a few thousand degrees in the kiln, it is now one solid piece. This is an example of our coaster classes that we teach here. If you go to the collection next door, send you on the scavenger hunt, we have this beautiful piece by June Kaneko. It's about this tall. And you can see all those layers of glass in between. Those were all fused or fired in a kiln to create one solid piece. If we elaborate on fusing, thank you, we could do slumping. So again, I have a single pane of glass. Started out with a solid sheet on the back and a couple pieces that we scored, snapped, and glued down to the front and then fired. We could take this extremely large coaster and we could put it in a mold. That's what Kuhn is walking around, is a ceramic mold. So once you've fired your piece into one, you can then place it in said mold, reheat it, and as glass gets warm, it softens. It kind of drips and sags like I do at the beach in my chair. And then I become one with this shape. So this is actually one of the older forms of glass making to create kind of shapes or vessels because they're kind of low profiles. So we go from a flat sheet to kind of a nice little serving dish. In the collection, we have this piece by an artist named Tutz Zinsky. Uh, they actually visited us a few years ago, and it was really exciting to see her work. What was going on is they did this process of fusing and slumping, but they pull hundreds of little pieces of glass, little threads, little strings, and we'll show that in a bit. She pulls hundreds of these, almost weaves them together like a basket, fuses them, and then slumps them. But in the middle of the slumping process, where her artistry really comes in, is they open up the kiln while it's up at temperature, a few thousand degrees again, and reaches in with some tools and Kevlar gloves on their hands and pushes the piece around to give it this kind of nice, organic, ruffled shape. Truly exciting, you know? Not something that a lot of artists do is touch the piece while it's in the kiln. Usually you kind of set it, forget it, come back in a few days and it's done. As we move from upstairs to downstairs, we have flame working over here. This is a method that uses torches that are powered by a combination of propane and oxygen to get a flame that's about two to 3,000 degrees, hot. Almost similar to a welder's torch, but we use a different combination of gases because it's cleaner for our material. What we can do with this is we can shape different materials or different rods and tubes of glass and create a series of objects. Usually this method lends itself to kind of details and small intricate objects being made. Kuhn here is walking around a sample of our botanical. It's like a flower class that we teach over a weekend or some jewelry is made this way. One of my favorite methods, because I specialize in this method, is scientific wear. So here is a condenser coil that, you know, in a lab you would find where you could run a liquid or a vapor through the middle you could run cool water through this exterior chamber, and you could take a gas to a liquid. This is made using that technique as well. What's also neat about this particular item is if we look closely, it's labeled as Pyrex, like the stuff you have at home. That is a name brand of the specific type of glass called borosilicate 
that we use over here. In the collection, we have this chess set by Gianni Tosso. I would consider him an Italian maestro or master. And this piece is phenomenal. Let me tell you what. The reason I think it is is that there are so many little figures. They each have their own face. They each have their own objects in their hands. And it's not just like one sculpture, in my opinion. It's like 30 little sculptures there for you to look at and investigate as you could make a chessboard. In the same area as flameworking, we teach neon. Not a lot of studios have that as a class. But this is, again, using a series of different torches that are actually powered by propane and just compressed air. Believe it or not, it is a cooler flame relative to glass art. And you'll use a tube of glass, and you can warm and bend it into a pattern. In our classes, we usually focus on like a simple line drawing. But as you get more skilled in it, this is where you can start creating all the words and those beautiful signs you see at maybe your favorite restaurants or spots around town. Fun fact about neon, it is all made by hand. All of it. Everything you've ever seen that's a neon sign, somebody built that by hand. The way we get the illumination in there is actually we suck out any of the ambient air in the tube. We put it under vacuum. And then we add just a little bit of neon, or maybe argon with a little drop of mercury on the inside, just a drop. And when you run a current through this tube with those gases in it, you get that beautiful glow that we all know. Examples are always we have a shop sign over here, or we have the love, love, hate, hate, fear, fear over in this corner. Those two gases only make a red or blue color. So to get the variation you might see in the wild is it's actually a phosphor coating on the inside of the tube to create you know, your blues, your greens, maybe white in that case, to give us the range of colors that you can get in neon. We have this piece over in the main collection. It's technically a plasma piece, slightly different than neon, but it's using the same principles. They have a glass orb. They have an electrode. That's the object in the middle, creating an, a current. And then you get those nice little lightning bolts coming out through a noble gas carrying that current. And then as we move on to the floor here, this is the hot shop. Hot shop. This is where we'll actually use various metal tools here and a furnace and a series of other tools, which we'll get to in a moment, to shape and manipulate glass. This is usually what most people think about when they consider glass blowing. Have we all seen Blown Away on Netflix yet? I see some hands, see some nods. If you guys enjoy what you see here today, and let's say you like competitive cooking shows, this is that with glass blowers. So they get a topic, and then like eight people have to sculpt or make an object within a set time frame, and it's pretty exciting, at least for me. And a lot of the artists on that show have been to this studio. So that's a little tidbit for us. To discuss the first step is hot sculpting. We're actually using solid glass on a punty. This is a solid rod most often. And you can shape and manipulate the material very similar to clay, except we can't touch it. We'll use metal tools to touch. But it is plastic in the true sense of the word of you could really make whatever you want. In this case, we had the bird on a tree stump, or as we come closer to summer, starfishes. In the collection, we have our ever favorite at this studio, Shrimp Girl. And I know what you're thinking. What's going on? Why is the girl real small? Well, I tell you, she's not small. It's just a big shrimp. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. But it's a funny piece that we always reference because, again, it is all solid glass there, no blown elements yet. And it's a lot of texture and detail being able to be added without adding air just yet. And then glass blowing. So here we'll use air added to our piece. This, on a historic contents, drastically expanded but what you could do with glass. So by adding air, we suddenly were able to make vessels that were this big, this big. And it took enough time to get metals that could withstand the temperatures that we could melt glass in. So through human history, we needed materials strong enough to make the material do what we need. So if you look at some of our older objects of the collection, they are all this big. And then as you move through history, we can start getting to different bottles, cups, 
vases, all the things you can think about glass being used for started with kind of glass blowing or really expanded or grew with the glass blowing. In the collection, we have this piece by Hiroshi Yamano. Uh, he was an artist who traveled all the way from Japan to be with us a year or two ago. And he told us that one of the neatest things about his work is he uses a little bit of silver, actual silver, on his works, a little silver foil. And he said the best silver to use for this is from Japan, of course. What he does with it is while the glass is hot, he pressed silver leaf and foil on the surface and it sticks. It's actually just compatible enough with the material that it won't harm each other. He can then later go back and scratch through and etch and then carve through that to create imagery or patterns. So if you see like those little clouds or fish on that design, silver that he cut through. Very exciting to see that. After he was here, we all made a big order because we all wanted to do it too. So that's kind of like the brief intro of our materials, but let's talk about the tools. I'm gonna put on my safety glasses real quick as we start to get these things out. Kuhn comes pre-equipped. And in the middle here, we have our furnace. I'll have her open the door. What you're hearing now is a burner that's keeping that furnace at about 2,150 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. And what that's doing is keeping a crucible that holds approximately 500 pounds of molten glass at its fullest, hot. And we leave this tool on always. If we turn it on and off, it can take a week to come down and a week to come up to temperature for us to even be able to use anything. So it's actually more efficient for us to just leave it running, and then we can come back and scoop out as we need. When it empties, we'll sort of top it off every few days to keep it nice and full, for us as artists to use, and for students to have a good experience to get material out. Just next to that, where Kuhn's at now, is our pipe warmer. It does exactly what it sounds like. It warms our pipes. The purpose of that is hot glass likes to stick to hot metal. So when we pre-warm the ends of our tools here, it actually allows us to get more glass out of our furnace at a time than if it were cold. As we kind of scooch down the wall, Kuhn is moving a heat shield. We stand behind this because the tool she's about to open up is also the same temperature of the furnace, right over 2,000 degrees. Sorry, y'all, in the corner, it is a hot day and it's going to get hotter for you in just a moment. What you see inside there is just heat. There is no material stored in this tool. We call this our reheating chamber or glory hole. What it's for is as we work, the glass cools and gets stiffer and we need to keep it soft so we can inflate it, we can shape it, we can sculpt it, do what we need to do to create an object. This tool will help us keep rewarming the glass to make it malleable enough to work. We do turn this one on and off as needed and it takes about an hour to come up to temp, kind of like an oven at home. So when we're done at the day, we'll shut that off and when we come in first thing, we'll turn them on for however many workstations we need for that afternoon. Finally, we need a kiln. What I'm standing next to right here, this is a small kiln, believe it or not. And the purpose of this tool is to slowly cool the glass off. If we made a beautiful face and we left it out after it's done being sculpted, it would break. Maybe not within the first minute, maybe not the first 30 minutes, but it would definitely break, most likely that afternoon. What's happening here is, as glass cools, the exterior skin touching the air is shrinking, but the core is still warm and expanding. Those create stress in the material that would cause it to crack. So to eliminate those stresses, once our piece is done, we'll walk it to the kilns in the back here. We have four larger ones that Kuhn and I could curl up inside and do a little patty cake if needed. They're that big and we'll set it in that kiln to continue cooling off from a few thousand degrees to room temperature. That rate at which it cools is determined by how thick the object is. So believe it or not, this bird takes longer to cool than say this face. Even though it looks bigger, it's thinner so it cools more evenly faster. Whoop. Let's 
get a little material out. So we're going to do some property studies, and we'll make a vessel together. So Kuhn here has just grabbed a punty. It is a solid metal rod, and she's spin, spun it into that vat of glass to get a gather. And as she turns, it stays on center. But if she stops, whoa, 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 it drips. Also, while it's this hot, I can just snip right through it and just make little marbles. Or, you ready? We could pull those thin, thin stringers. Remember the artist I was just discussing who did hundreds of threads and wove these, lots and lots of these. And then because I've been working for about 10 years, I have no more sensation in my fingertips, and I can grab molten glass. No. It's so thin, it's actually cooled just enough that I can grab it. It's not hot at all. My mom would beg to differ. <laughs> but conversely, what this is showing is how flexible this material is. Have you ever thought about making a lasso out of glass before? Or maybe we can tie a knot in a bow? So what I've kind of made here are artisanal grade fiber optic cables. So I actually leave a little sample up here. If you'd like to inspect, do so very carefully. Do not take it home. It is not a good souvenir. But that is almost what your fiber optic cables look like. Theirs are much more optically pure and are a lot thinner. You can coil it around your finger while I can make a little O. But if you need a new internet service, Kuhn and I are running deals. It'll be about 10 years out, but we'll hook you up. So let's do a similar thing but with a bubble. So now she's grabbed a blowpipe. It has a hole through the middle of this pipe. And again, she's coiling glass on the end, getting a gather. And then what she has on the end of her pipe is a gather. What we need to do before we add a little bit of air to it is chill the sides. We need this to be hot, but not too hot. Kind of like Goldilocks temperature. And then we're going to add a little air. The method that we've developed here at the studio is the blowmatic. You ready? This allows us to continue to inflate our glass, because traditionally, we would use our mouths. But with COVID, we decided to use this to make it cleaner for everyone involved in the studio. And as we keep adding air, our bubble keeps growing. Inevitably, it'll get to a point that it's cooled off enough, there's not enough material, and it won't move anymore. Looks like we're getting there, maybe. That might be it. Here, I'll disconnect you. There you go. You're free. Nice little pop, huh? And what this kind of shows, just like that string, is how flexible this material can be. This one's really nice. Do we see that? It's got a little bend. Again, it's just a very thin, thin sheet of glass, but I can kind of warp it ever so slightly, and it has some springiness to it. Again, something before I became a glass worker and an artist never knew this material could do. I've always assumed it's like, yeah, it's like windows, it's hard. No. Even window glass, I have a friend who's taken large panes and with ratchet straps has folded them into U's. Impressive, right? All right, we're all experts. Everyone knows what we're doing? Cool, let's make an object together. So Kuhn and I have worked a few times together, and we discussed some details of what we wanted to make. And we're going with kind of a vessel today. But I'm going to do a little bit more less traditional coloring technique. So I've prepped some color in our garage here that's warming up, and I'll explain that in a moment. And I've gotten a gather of glass on a slightly larger blowpipe, and then in these gravy boats, I have some more color. What the color is, is actually little chips of glass that has been crushed up and turned into powders or frits. Powders are kind of like talc powder, baby powder. Fritz might be like sand or little pebbles or stones of color. The way we pigment glass 
is actually metal oxides added to the raw materials of clear. Kind of the basic idea is it is silica, a main component of sand, which is what a lot of us think of, soda ash, and lime. Those three ingredients create what we know as soda lime glass. Kind of straightforward. That creates pretty much all the material or all the glass you usually see around you. There's a couple hundred formulas of glass, but that's one of the primary ones. So when we take those raw materials and we add some metal oxides to it, we get pigments or different shades. Ooh, I'm going to sprinkle these on the table here, get a little accent of red. So for example, I'm adding red to my glass right now. Just a couple little chips. Because my core piece is so warm, they stick right to the surface. Those red chips, believe it or not, if red is your favorite glass color, you have exquisite taste. The reason is gold is involved with red very often. But that's not the only metal. Sometimes silver, manganese, cobalt are used to create various color shades for our work. This process of adding the pigmentation to the clear is not something that we do necessarily in our studio. We actually work with different color manufacturers to get these pieces, or to get these colors from them. There's a maybe half dozen around the world that are the primary ones, and then plenty of people kind of doing home experiments. But the primary ones are where we order from. So think about going to the paint store. You don't necessarily go to Sherwin-Williams and mix your own paint. You show them the swatch of the color that they developed, and then they put it together for you. We do something similar with our people. I'll go to their websites, kind of check out what they've got going on, and then I'll order what color I think looks nice. So if I want a particular color, I have to order that particular color. I can't necessarily say, take a little blue glass, a little yellow glass, and then I get green glass. No, I'm going to get more like blue-yellow swirls, because it's kind of a chemistry involved. Give it a little shape. And then give me some air, please. There we go. Yeah, we'll just get a bubble seeded. So what we've done now is I've added a dash of color. Coons hooked me up to the compressed air, so we're starting to make a bubble. And then again, to make sure I have control, I'm holding it in place with maybe one of my favorite tools. It's getting more and more difficult to come by this stuff. If you don't recognize it, it is called wet newspaper. You nailed it. But this allows me to almost touch and hold the glass. And what I'm watching is as this gets just a little bit rounder, I go from like a tube to kind of an egg shape to know that there's a bubble inside there. That should be plenty. Thank you. So what I'm going to wait for now is I'm going to allow this to cool. Kind of counterintuitive. The reason is, is I need to go back in the furnace to get another layer of glass on top to be able to have enough material to make an object. Right now, I could make like a solid tumbler, maybe like a highball glass if I'm good. But I wanted to do kind of a vessel. So I need extra material on top. And if this is too hot, it could drip into the furnace. So if I pause for a moment and let it cool, it'll never be stable enough that I can get that layer on top. It went from liquid to kind of rock hard within 30 seconds to a minute, even though it's still a few thousand degrees. So now I'm feeling comfortable that I could go over here to our furnace again. Thank you. And I can get that extra gather or layer on top of this piece. So we can see it grew just a little bit. Reading my mind. You're so good. Kuhn here is being a wonderful assistant in that because she has experience with this material, she kind of has an idea of maybe what she would want next during the process. 
And usually that's what maybe the gaffer or the person leading the project would want. So my phrase right now, or my position as the person kind of making a thing is a gaffer. That's kind of a traditional glass term. And Kuhn's my assistant right now. Not a fixed term, not something that you have to study for like a decade or anything to get that phrase. Nope, just kind of whoever's in the site is that person. So if we traded and I helped her make a piece, you could be a gaffer. I'd be your assistant. But what she helped me with is handed me a wooden block. This is actually a fruit wood that I keep dunking into a bucket of water behind me, just cooled water. It keeps this tool moist, so as I'm shaping it, it's less that it's burning the wood and more that there's a little steam forming this into kind of a round form. I'll get a little heat, we'll inflate, and then we'll start getting our fancy colors. So I wanted things to be even. Remember I said that the core with the color was colder? I added that extra layer of clear to the outside. Well, I wanted to smooth it out with that block to make it uniform. From here, I'm going to reheat so it's malleable uniformly, and then we'll add just a little bit more air. Again, just as Kuhn de uh, demonstrated, I'm always turning to try to keep my piece on center is what we call it. Thank you. And then I like to touch the very bottom of my vessel, because that's always the hottest part, to cool it off with a tool. And then we'll add some air, please. That way it inflates at the top and the sides and not a thin base. And then I can start evening it out depending on where I touch. That's plenty. Let's stop there. Thank you. Now, a little invisible tool, gravity. I'm resting my piece on this rail here and then slowly turning and allowing it just to get a little bit taller. If only it worked for all of us that way. So it's stretched due to gravity and the heat. So it got a little thinner, a little taller. We made it a little wider with some air. And then again, I'm going to let it cool slightly and then warm up the skin of it. I don't want it to be so hot that it's moving around, but I just want the exterior to be toasty. Because what I've done earlier before the demo is in the garage here, just above our pipe warmer, I've placed a few bits of cane or color rods to be pre-warmed. Because again, hot glass likes to stick to other hot glass. So if those were at room temperature, it might not work so well because they're bigger chunks than my initial pieces. And this is kind of a less traditional method of adding cane or line patterns to a piece because I'm kind of haphazardly putting them on. And I like it because it gives us a bit of a crazy pattern, something a little more unique, and uses some of the leftovers in the studio that might otherwise get recycled. So now it's a little sticky. If I have my temperatures right, I should just be able to kind of smoosh onto these color bits. Ooh, art. And then I'll have Kuhn open up the door here. And if I'm just the right size, which I'm a little big, I'm going to cheat and get some heat on there and allow them to kind of fold over on themselves. So I'm almost heating from the sides. That way I can begin to warm these canes and slowly smoosh them over. Oop. There we go. So then when I roll across our marver, or the metal table here, I can actually kind of fold them into that surface. And again, trying to stay on center or round with the piece. So I've taken all those kind of sticks of glass and placed them to one side. So I kind of have a front and back side of this piece now. 
as it's gotten narrower again, Kuhn's been opening and closing these doors to accommodate the size of the object. Thank you. That allows us to keep as much heat in the reheating chamber as possible. I don't know about you guys, but my grandpa was always very mad at me when I would open up the fridge door and just stare inside and just try to figure out what I wanted as a kid. And he'd say, close it, you're letting all the cold out. Kind of the same deal. We want to keep as much heat in there as possible. So if we change the aperture, the opening, we can kind of control that we can keep it a little hotter, which helps us work usually a little faster. In glass, most of the time, more heat's good. Not all the time, but most of the time. Many instances, if you're just starting to learn, you might hear an instructor say, turn, 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 heat, heat, heat. Because if your glass isn't hot, it might not do anything. It's not going to move. So my goal here is to try to smooth out that extra texture, all those canes, all that pattern. So I'm trying to warm it up and melt it in. So it's slowly getting smoothed out. I'm going to use a bit of that newspaper to kind of hold it in place. And Kuhn's actually going to inflate a little bit to help push those pieces together. Go ahead and blow. And off. And again, I'm rotating, trying to control those temperatures. And I'm actually squeezing a little bit, because again, it inflated some. And I'm not necessarily trying to make it bigger just yet. I'm trying to make it smoother, more of an even surface. Here, we'll go off. I'm going to add a little more heat. Thank you. So I've got kind of the bottom half melted in, but the top half, it's usually the colder part, because it's the last thing in and the first thing out of the reheating chamber, needs a little extra added to it. So I'm kind of cooling the bottom side with the paper and then really trying to smooth out the top end. I can, again, use the table here to really push and leverage against. It actually sucks away more heat than the paper does, being that this is a, about an inch thick of mild steel. And that helps me, again, control the temperatures. And then I'm holding it up so it gets a little shorter this time. And like I said, the very furthest point from me is usually the hottest, that's usually the spot that wants to inflate most, and is the bottom of our vessel. And that's typically where you want some thickness, so when you set it down, say on a table or a place where you'd like to store it or display, you want some extra material there, so you're not nervous of when you set it down. We'll do just a little air and then a strip gather on top, I believe. So once again, holding in the bottom end, and go on. Yeah, thank you. Keep going. And same as the first time, I'm kind of watching as the profile and the sides expand and change. That is great. We'll pause right there. Thank you. Excellent. So again, I'm at this kind of wait moment. I want this to cool slightly, so I'm going to get one more layer of clear. And it's going to be like a half layer. The way we do that is I'm going to gather around, and then I'll be able to hold this piece straight up and down and let some excess drip off into a large soup kettle that I have behind me. And then we can take all that leftover clear glass and throw it back in the furnace when we're done. Oh, we're in the theater. No, you, you're good. <laughs> so again, I'm kind of watching as this glow goes away, because it's not br as bright. I'm watching as when I pause, it's not nearly as drippy as, say, when we pulled that stringer, that long thread. 
it's kind of staying still. And again, if I do a little sound check, not always necessary, it's pretty stiff. I can go get some clear glass. A lot of this is done by feel. It's less of, I know this is exactly 800 degrees or 1200 degrees. No, it's just a lot of practice. And open, please. So I've got that extra layer. And now straight up and down, I can just drip it like honey almost. And then as I change the angle and spool, it snaps that string. And now I've just got a little bit of clear over top, just kind of encased everything. And then once again, to smooth it out, a bigger block. And again, this is to help even that new layer and those temperatures together. And in this method of adding consecutive layers, one on top of another, maybe different colors in between each layer, is how almost every blown glass object is made. So we necessarily can't get all of our material at once. We got to get little by little at a time. Whew, would you like to take a heat for me? That'd be wonderful. You got it? You need a door? Whoop, whoop. We might as well just leave one side open. There we go. Because, yeah, we'll start doing a jack line, and then we'll keep inflating. Whew. This is the nice thing about having assistant. I can take a little breather. I could check text messages. More importantly, I could have some water. It gets very warm. Ooh, much better. Because this is a hot studio and a very physical activity, it's pretty important to stay like hydrated while you work. So we'll just do a little bit of air. Go ahead. And that's plenty. Go off. You can unplug so I'm going to hang a little bit. So you can see Kuhn and I are constantly talking to each other to make sure we're on the same page. And now what I'm adding is a jack line or a constriction line. Because really what I've created is just a big old lump of glass on the end of a pipe. There'd be no way to remove this easily without a score mark. So that's what I'm doing here, is I'm using a hinged tool with a little bit of beeswax on it so it glides across the surface of the glass to cut a constriction mark. Will you do another heat for me, please? And we'll do another jack line. Thank you. So to keep this nice and lubricated, I got a little extra beeswax next to me that I can slide the tool through. Otherwise, it makes the most atrocious screeching nails on a chalkboard sound. And that's usually when your friend across the studio goes, wax your jacks, because you have a little shame. Nobody wants to hear it. Ah, thank you. This is a great heat. So now when it's softer, I can really shape and manipulate. Kind of the analogy we go with this is it's like a chocolate bar line. Yeah, we'll get ready for some more air. Go ahead and blow, please. Yeah, keep going. This is great. Again, I'm primarily holding the base in to keep it cool so the sides get a little thinner and expand out. That's awesome. We'll stop right there for a moment. And what I'm attempting to do right now is I want to put in a slightly secondary jack line. I've got one right here that'll help me kind of separate the piece, and I'll create another one and create just a little bit of a neck. Would you take another heat for me? Again, the nice thing about the assistant is now I can switch between tools. So most things in the glass blowing just scale up as we get bigger. So this is a slightly larger pair of jacks, which just keeps my arm further away from the piece and fits around the piece better. I've seen one pair as a bit of a joke at the school called Pilchuck, which is kind of like glass blowing summer camp in Washington State, that would be about the size of this bench.
So I'm kind of pinching and I'm pulling towards that wall with my hands. And this is, again, creating a bit of a neck or the top half of a vessel. Ooh, there's the hearing test. Did we all hear that screech? And I like to make sure that these lines are pretty sharp. It just makes for a more even connection. Cool, we'll see if we can get a little air. I'll have you hook up. There we go, and go ahead and inflate. Yeah, you can go on, just squeeze all the way. Yeah. So if our temperatures are just right, if the glass is nice and hot, it does not take a lot of pressure. But if the glass gets cold, we of course have to increase that pressure. But keep in mind, we can usually do this with our mouths, so you don't need to be a trumpet player or a brass instrument player to do this. Most of the time, it's like cooling off a bowl of soup. You know, you blow gently. That's probably good. I'll get a little more heat for us. Let you take a moment. And then, as we kind of discussed, as this piece gets larger, we open up more doors to make it easier to go in and out. As we also work, I don't necessarily need to heat the whole thing, so I might scooch away a little bit and just heat the bottom or the body of the piece, not so much that neck. This is to help keep me have or to help me keep control over the piece, because if it's really dancing around on the pipe, I might not be able to keep it center or even if that's my goal for the artwork. All right, we'll do some more air, please. Go ahead and on. And now we can really start to see it move on the sides. Off for a moment. I'm going to readjust this neck. So again, I'm kind of squeezing and pulling away from myself to create almost this little cylinder on top of this vessel form at the base. We'll get some more heat again. Thank you. Oh, yes, please. Wonderful. So when I usually first go in and out of the reheating chamber, I do what's called a flash. I'll go all the way in and heat the whole thing, and then maybe I scooch out and then just heat, again, right where I need it to go. And I'm actually turning in two directions, so I might switch, because if I spin in only one, I could start to twist the piece when it gets so warm. It's kind of more of an advanced thing. You don't necessarily have to do it when you work, but it does help keep kind of consistency in your work. And then I kind of slowly scoop in and start to cradle the piece, and then we'll add some more air. Go ahead. Yeah, now we're getting there. Yeah, keep going. I'm liking the direction we're getting to now. And off. I think that looks pretty good, don't you? Again, kind of adjusting that the neck stays nice. Making sure that those constriction lines, the score marks, are nice and sharp. And again, I'm actually going to let it cool slightly. Because now that I got most of the vessel, I need a flat spot for it to sit. And if I go and warm the whole thing, and I compress to create a flat bottom, it's not going to work very well. But if I just warm right here in a moment, we can create a nice even space for this to sit on. So I'll go get that heat. Ah. 
I'll go in all the way to flash to keep all of it nice and warm, because if any part of it drops below 1,000 degrees-ish, it could crack. And then I'll scooch out and really just focus on the very bottom. And then, Kuhn, I'll have you flatten with the paddle, please. So I'll go on the sides, and I'll have you touch down. Go ahead. Yeah, this is looking great. Keep going. And off. Wonderful. So now you see we've lightly compressed and created kind of a little divot here. Let's get a punty ready. So at this moment, we've done all the inflating I want to do. I've gotten a nice little neck, I've gotten a vessel, I've gotten a flat side, but I need to get it off the blowpipe to finish the top. The way we do that is Kuhn's actually getting an extra bit of glass on a punty or a solid rod, and we're going to make sure we put this right on center, or as best we can, to then crack this off, and we'll rewarm and finish the top half. So glass very much as we'll work from one direction, and then we'll flip and work the other direction. I'm going to go take a flash right behind you. If anyone's ever worked in like a kitchen or anything, like a restaurant, you know how you're always saying, door, behind you, tray, hot dishes. We're doing the same thing because no one wants to bump into each other. So that's why I said, behind you, I'm taking a flash, so that way she doesn't immediately just stand up and whip around to get her piece hot. And I hook my leg over on the bench so I can lean really far out and a little, little kiss, make sure it's nice and straight. Is it perfectly straight front row? Yeah, all right, I I'll take it, I'll take it. Do you feel good? So with a little bit of water, I add it right to the neck here and it will rotate towards me little extra, and towards me, and one more. And these little drops are cracking the glass. You ready? With a slight tap, it jumps off. I'll have you flash and heat that. I'm going to take away the scraps. So I've got a little extra on my blowpipe. I have two recycle bins over here. One's labeled for colored glass, and one is for clear. I could kind of mention earlier, if it's clear glass, we'll take that back and put it back in our furnace. If it's color glass, we will recycle it through the city like you would bottles and glass at home. So we have about half a dozen bins out back full of all the leftovers. Thank you. So here is where I can kind of check that the piece is straight. And there's sometimes you can do a little wiggle room. I can double check that everything's about where I want it. And now I'm really going to heat this edge. It's extra cold. I just put water on it, and it broke intentionally. So now I need to warm it up so it moves. Because I don't want a jagged edge for anybody. I want a nice smooth lip. So as I've already mentioned before, I'll go in. I'll flash the whole thing to keep it nice and warm. And then I'll come back out and kind of just focus on that top half. This way, I'm heating that new edge, and I can start to shape and manipulate that space. Once we're on the punty here, things get a little more delicate. Most of the time, artists are going to start moving a little slower. They might not move and place their pieces down more aggressively, because it's a very temporary connection. It's not supposed to be permanent. And this is usually one of the longer heats as we try to get that lip or the top cold section warm again. So hopefully there's a nice glow. I can see it through my vessel. So here, I can take my tweezers and start to stretch and pull just to get a little bit taller.
Get my jacks in. Sorry, everyone. I'm told if uh, you're above a certain age, you might not have heard anything, so you don't even know what I'm talking about. But that was that screech I mentioned. I'll get a little more heat, and we'll take care of that bit. So I tried to pull kind of, it looks like a little crown at the top. That was thinning and stretching and more evenly manipulating that top bit. And then I started to constrict it down because we're actually going to crack. We're going to snap it off. So I got a nice heat. I can kind of see how that top end's glowing. I'll take my jacks and I cut a nice sharp line. I go in to make sure it's even, because I want it to be chilled. Ready, my friend? I'm going to dunk my hand. I give it a little yank, yank, yank. Go. There it is. So with that light tap, that piece just snapped right off, leaving me a more even edge than we initially had. It snapped off because I warmed it and then cooled it precisely with a metal tool. So when Kuhn tapped it, it just cracks right where I want. I held the piece up when we did that, so the shock goes right at that spot and not through the whole vessel. So now I'm going to start opening things. So we have a nice top. Boop, boop. Thank you. Kuhn's using the wooden paddle that we had used to flatten the bottom to actually protect my arm. And I'll go out. I might actually switch back to the baby jacks. Because while I've done this nearly every day for some years now, it's still hot. And Kuhn's making sure that if my arm is covered, I can focus on the piece and less of, ah, 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 my elbow's on fire. That doesn't mean that there isn't safety material or clothing I could wear. Sometimes artists might have a Kevlar sleeve, like what a fireman may wear, to cover their arm. A lot of people are always curious, like, what about gloves? Why don't you wear some gloves if it's so hot? Well, the issue with gloves is you might lose dexterity. We have to have a lot of finger control. And I'll come off. We're going to get that one more again. I gotta have a lot of finger control for many of these tools. And if I have gloves on, I lose all of that. Imagine playing guitar with gloves on. You could, but you might not hit the strings the way you want. So for that reason, we're most often using just our bare hands. I'm trying to make sure that that top bit's pretty nice. So I'm opening this tool and lifting towards the sky, towards the ceiling, to create kind of a little cylinder on top. Yeah, and I'll have you press on the lip, try to see if we can shape that a little bit. Oh yeah, that's much nicer. Ooh, yeah. I like it, do you like it? You are okay with this one? <laughs> Here, I'll get a little flash, and then we'll start to wrap things up. So, Kuhn, you can definitely go suit up, please. Thank you. I'm getting a short heat, because I don't want it to be hot enough to move. I just want it to stay toasty. So what Kuhn's getting ready to do is we got to put this in the kiln. What you just heard was the shedding. That was the glass cracking off the pipe as it cooled. That's how we removed the leftovers. So I'll do another heat and I'll walk around in case anyone wanted to snap a pick or anything. Because again, I can't let it get too cold. So a little vessel, and then as it cools, we'll see more and more of that pattern on the surface. Because right now, everything just looks like orange and red and hot, like a lot of things do when they're 2,000 degrees. 
But trust me, I chose some vibrant colors. There's some reds, some oranges, some bright yellows on there. Do one more short little heat. So I'm trying to even out those temperatures. And then I'm going to get ready to hand it to Coot. So again, I'm gently placing things down, gently moving. I'm actually going to get a little bit more water. I'm going to tilt away from myself. I put a little water on that connection point so it shocks it right there. You ready? Whoop. Oh, it's angry. Hold on. Oh, this one's not so happy. Oh, it came off pretty well. That's a shock for me. I'll explain what happened in just a moment. Thank you all. So Kuhn's now placing this piece into the kiln, again, for it to slowly cool. What I got nervous there for a moment is I thought that I might have fused this to the bottom. That could have happened where I added too much heat to one side or the other when we stuck it on. I overheated while working on it. So I got nervous. Nervous that I might make a flower pot, a little hole in the bottom, than an actual nice vessel. But thankfully, actually, it cracked pretty smooth. It was holding on tight, but it did let go with no opening in the bottom. Yes. <laughs> so thank you guys for hanging out. Give it up for Kuhn for assisting. Yeah, Kuhn. At this moment, I could take like two or three questions if there's anything I didn't cover, anything you're dying to know about glass, or either us. Not everyone all at once now. Yes. How old was I when I first started blowing glass? Uh, I was in high school, actually. So when I was in Toledo, Ohio, just for high school, because my family moved around a little bit, like I said, the Toledo Museum is kind of our sister museum. They also have a very nice studio as a part of the museum, and I was able to take glass blowing classes after school. So a lot of people who do like guitar or something, I was doing art courses. So I started out with photography, and then later welding. And my welding teacher's like, you like sculpting and you like being hot? You know, we're world famous for glass blowing. And I was like, really? And I haven't looked back since. So I did about two years in high school, so maybe 17, 18 or so. And then I went to VCU in Richmond to study for four years, have a degree in craft and material studies, focusing on glass blowing. Yeah. How old were you when you started? 20? So she's been working for four or five years now? Yeah, and is a fantastic sculptor. You got to ask Kuhn to see some of her sculptures after the, the demo. Any other questions? Yeah. Why did I draw on the concrete? So if you guys didn't notice, I have a little drawing down here that's a loose sketch of what I wanted to make. What's nice about putting it here, especially on the floor, is while I'm working, I can look at my piece and at the drawing at the same time and price check them to one another. So say I want it to make it X big, I can look straight through each other, and if they line up, I know I'm getting to the ballpark that I want. It also is an easy place to put a drawing for me and my assistant or assistants to help me. Because if I was doing a really big piece, I might have two or three people helping me out. So one person could be doing tools, one person's adding air, and one person's just reheating. And this is a nice central location for us to be all on the same page. Yeah. One more. Yeah. How long will the piece have to stay in the kiln? It's probably going to be about 12 to 24 hours, I would say. But what we do is we rate it to the thickest object in the kiln that day. So if someone made, say, a bowling ball of glass, kind of like the one in the back here, it's right behind that three or that six-tiered glass case on the right-hand side. It's like this. That piece would take weeks in the kiln, potentially. So a piece could be in the kiln with, for extra amount of time, but not enough time is, isn't going to help it. So that particular object, maybe a day. But if somebody loads the bowling ball in there, it could hang out for a week with its friend. Yeah. Well, guys, oh. The glass? A 
here when I was at the end, and I knocked it off. So what I was doing is I was using the tweezers, and I crimped it, and I was pulling, actually. So if I had my vessel, I was pulling that lip towards the wall, which is actually thinning that space out so it's a little more even. And then when I constricted it, it created a score mark for it to snap nicely there. So the crimping is more of a side effect of touching with the tool. Really, the goal is to make it even and thin at the top. If I don't do that, it's more likely that there might be a thick side, a thin side. It might go like this around the top. And now it's a little smooth and looks pretty for me. Yeah. Uh, I do have to get off the mic. But I will be around while we clean up. So if I didn't get to your question, just come on up. Talk to us. We'll hang out for a little bit. Otherwise, enjoy your visit, guys. I'm glad you hung out for the studio, and I'm glad you got to see a demo. Cheers. <laughs>